All right, I've called Brother Roger to lead us in the first song, so, so uh, it would be nice if everyone can raise their voice and stand up to sing and help uh, Brother Roger as he leads us in, in the singing. So let's all sing and praise God. Thank you, Brother Hadi. First, uh, I'll sing our song. I want to read some, uh, some verse from Psalm 28, verse 6 and 7. It said, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiced, and with my song I will praise him. Then we will sing the amazing grace. Thank you. 
given unto us every day you've given us uh, um, strength um, wisdom and loving kindness and uh, righteousness and mercies you've given unto us we thank you for uh, giving us the strength every day to come to go to work and to uh, to be able to come here and to give back these offerings uh, to you dear Lord we thank you for um, getting us here uh, safely to, so that we can, we're can able to uh, learn from you and be challenged by your sermon uh, today, delivered to us by our guest speaker, Brother Glenn Pettifer. May we be uh, challenged by it and learn from this sermon that he, that he has for us today. Dear Lord, I thank you for I, I would like to pray for these um, offerings that these offerings will go to the uh, missionaries that we are supporting and that these offerings will support our church church ministry and um, may your will be done with these offerings blessed be the gift and the giver in Jesus name Amen Before the message, uh, we will sing another song, but uh, I'll read some verses first. In Revelation 4.11, it said, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by you will they exist and will create it. Please stand up, and we will sing worthy of worthy.
I have, I have the privilege of sharing God's Word with you today and I think both next Sunday as well, uh, which is going to be really good. Uh, well, we can continue to be looking at the book of Galatians this morning. We're looking at uh, chapter 5 uh, this morning. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Galatians 5. We're going to be looking at verses 16 to 25. And I've, I've entitled my message this morning, The Believer's Battle. Well, today, I don't know about you, but it, it seems to me that society sends a lot of mixed signals. They seem to send us a lot of mixed signals all the time. One I've noticed that regularly pops up, if, if you regularly watch TV, you might have seen it as well. There's, there's TV ads um, basically uh, encouraging us to bet, to gamble. You've seen these betting ads. There's usually sport betting ads. There's quite a lot of them, um, and it seems that there's one every ad break. I don't know about you, but every ad break there's, there's this sport betting ad. And this, the sport betting company that's presenting their ads, they, they might make it really appealing and exciting. Uh, usually in the ad there's, there's, there's a group of young men, you usually find that every ad. And they're, the one in particular that I'm thinking of, they're, they're running through a field. It's this open field, you've probably seen it. And, and they're, they're, they're trying not to get hit by the thousands of other young men that are running around on this field. And also all the, the athletes that are representing the different sports. They're all running around crazily on this field. And they, ha they have a brief moment while they're running around where they get to dive into a bunker so that they have just enough time to place a bet on their, on their app, on their phone. You know, because they've got to get that bet in. Got to place the bet on their phone. And, and it, it seems, you know, it seems like such an exciting ad. It seems like, oh, such a thrilling ad. Something that you, the viewer, and especially if you're a young man, would be interested in doing. However, as soon as the ad finishes, there's a pause, the screen goes black, and then all of a sudden this white writing pops up on the screen, and you, you probably know what I'm talking about. And there's this voiceover warning you of the dangers of betting and gambling. It's such a, such a mixed signal. It encourages you to stop doing well, to stop gambling before you gamble your life away. So how should you respond as you're sitting comfortably at your home, on your couch? What are you meant to think about this ad? Is betting on sports an exciting and fulfilling hobby? Or is it something that you should do all you can to avoid since it could ruin your life. They're completely two different questions and the same ad basically is asking the same question. They're mixed signals. They're completely mixed signals. And I, I think as you sit there, or I, I find that as I sit there on my couch, I'm, I'm presented with this internal struggle. <laughs> like, it's like a battle of the will. Which way do I go? What's the best? What's the better option here? I mean, in a sense, as a believer, we all know. As believers, we know what the better option is. But if you try, if you think of it objectively, it's like, where would you go? <laughs> you wouldn't know where to go. And I think this is a good illustration of, of the battle that rages inside every believer. Every moment of every day, Christians are in a battle of their wills to decide if they will walk in the spirit or fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In my uh, previous message that I shared with you several months back, we looked at the first 15 verses of chapter 5, where Paul explored the theology of Christian liberty ending with the calling that every believer has to love your neighbour as 
yourself. He shows us in verse 14 how this one commandment fulfills all of the Old Testament law. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Verses 1 to 15 encourage us to live in the liberty that Christ has obtained for us, to avoid legalism and avoid using this freedom to sin, but instead use it to love our neighbours. But Paul ended that section in verse 15 with this disturbing image of people biting and devouring each other like raging beasts. So to avoid this, he helps us to understand this battle that goes on in every believer. And this is where he shows us the ongoing battle. And it is an ongoing battle. It's a daily battle. Our passage begins in verse 16. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul immediately gives God's solution for us to avoid consuming each other and the way in which we can love our neighbour. It is through the enabling of God's Holy Spirit. The imagery that Paul uses is taken straight from Psalm 1. And let me read that to you. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. It seems that's what Paul is thinking of here as well. He's thinking of Psalm 1. Walking is regularly used in Scripture as a picture of one's life or lifestyle. It's the idea of life being like a journey. To bring out the meaning more clearly, we could say here, as you journey through life, walk in the Spirit. But what does the Scripture mean by this phrase, walking in the Spirit? The Amplified Bible explains it as being responsive to and controlled and guided by God's Holy Spirit. By opening yourself up to the leading of God's Spirit, you are able to avoid the second half of the verse. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Another way we could put this second part is you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So let's ask another question here. What does the Bible mean by the flesh? Is it purely our physical bodies? Or is there a broader meaning to this phrase? One writer describes it as the sin-desiring aspect of our whole being as opposed to the God-desiring aspect. It is the part or the aspect of our hearts which is not yet renewed by the Spirit. It's been said... It is the flesh that is the performer, it is the spirit that is the transformer. In other words, the flesh does the sinning, but the spirit does the sanctifying. It does the changing inside of us, making us more and more like Christ. It's important here that we get the order right. The verse is not saying that we walk in the Spirit by not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. That's not right. Because if we were to think of it that way, we would be putting the focus solely on us and taking taking God out of the picture altogether. It's not a matter of firing up our own wills and simply gritting our teeth and not sinning. It's not that simple. It's not that straightforward. It wouldn't be a battle if it was that easy. Someone once said, our hope of victory is not in our good resolutions and intentions, but in complete submission and yielding to the Spirit's word of grace. Titus 2, 11 and 12 bring this out clearly for us. 
For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age. Did you pick that up? The Holy Spirit teaches us through His grace that He gives us. But we still do have a part to play in this. In the next chapter, Paul states in verse 8, in chapter 6, he says, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. If we simply give in to our sinful urges, if we willingly give in when we are tempted to sin, we will be corrupting ourselves, the scripture says. But if we submit to walking in the spirit, then we will receive the eternal life that God freely wants to give us. Let me add that this verse is not a one or the other scenario. This verse is not saying you can lose your salvation by sowing to your flesh. That's not what it means. For the believer, the one who has believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, they can choose to either live a sinful existence in this life and miss out on the blessings in the next, or they can choose to live a blessed existence now and also receive blessings in the future. In verse 17, Paul explains the ongoing battle further for us. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. The flesh and the spirit are in in constant war with each other inside every believer. The Christian life is not a passive existence, but a constant struggle in that sense. With the old ways of the flesh that continue to tempt and seduce the believer. At the end of the verse, Paul reminds us that sometimes the flesh wins the battle. Preventing us from doing what we want to do. This is an ongoing struggle that is often a daily struggle. I find many times in my life, there's been times when I have just really wished that the struggle would end. But at times it just seems so overbearing. It just seems really hard. Maybe there are the times when I'm not walking in the Spirit. The struggle, the struggle with sin at times can be intense and it can cause us to feel like we're losing. Paul knew this struggle as well. And this is what caused him to cry out in Romans 7 verse 24. And you probably know the the verse. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It is these times that we need to do what he does in the next verse and remember what Christ has accomplished on our behalf in setting us free from the punishment and power of sin. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, Paul now considers this battle between the spirit and the flesh in relation to the law. He's challenged the Galatians quite regularly throughout uh, this letter on their views of the law or what they were beginning to believe about the law. And so he says this, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And this was important for them to hear this. They needed to hear this. They were close, as I've said several times, as I've I've shared with you from Galatians, they were close to believing the false teaching of these Judaizers that were uh, teaching them. They were close to believing that they needed Christ plus the law. Well, Paul blows this teaching right out of the water with this one simple verse. 
When a believer is walking in the Spirit, when they are allowing God's Holy Spirit to control and guide them as they live each day, they are living in a way that reveals they are not under the law. They are not required to keep the law perfectly. No one is required to keep it perfectly. We are, in a sense, if we want to be with God, we are required to keep it perfectly. But God has provided a way in which we don't have to by believing in his Son. We are not under the curse if we are accepting Christ as our Saviour. The Galatians are living, or they should be living, In the liberty by which Christ has made them free. Another writer points out this. He says, to live under the law is to live by the flesh, even when one is not actually committing sin. Because that is the only avenue available to the legalist. In other words, it's the only avenue available to the one who's trying to keep the law. The flesh is powerless to fulfill the law. And the law is powerless to conquer the flesh. When we're walking in the spirit, we are not living by the flesh, but we are actually fulfilling the law by loving our neighbours. It's kind of a bit of a paradox. We're doing what is impossible for us to do. The law is powerless to the fight, to fight the flesh. It can't do it. It's, It's the wrong weapon, so to speak. Romans 8 verses 3 to 4 says this as much. It says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In uh, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, who's the author of that well-known book, he describes a certain location that he calls the interpreter's house. And Pilgrim, or, or Christian as he's referred to in the story, he enters this house during his journey to the celestial city. Now the parlor of this house was completely covered with dust, we're told in the story. And when a man took a broom and started to sweep, he and the others in the room began to choke from all the dust that's just being blown around the room. They start choking. The more vigorously that he sweeps, the more suffocating the dust becomes. Dust still stays there. And the interpreter who owns the house, he, he orders a maid to come and sprinkle water in the room. And, and, and this, this actually, what it does with the dust is it washes the dust away. And the interpreter explains in the, in the story, he explains to Pilgrim that the parlour represents the heart of an unsaved man. And the dust is the original sin. The man with the broom is the law. And the maid with the water is the gospel. His point is, is that the law can, it can't do anything with the sin. All it can do is stir it up. It doesn't actually get rid of it. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can actually wash our sin away. In the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel uh, 36 and verse 27, the Lord tells the prophet of a future time when he will give those who believe in him his spirit that will cause them to keep his law. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. If you're a believer here today, you are experiencing, if you're walking in the spirit, you are experiencing the fulfillment of this verse in your life. You are walking in God's statutes statutes and keeping his judgments as you walk in the spirit 
Well, after explaining this battle that goes on in every believer, now Paul explains the works of the flesh. In this next section, Paul wants us to know what he means specifically by these works of the flesh. He also states that these are evident, that they can be plainly seen and known. They're not subtle, although sin can be subtle at times. But in this, in this case, he's not meaning them in a subtle way. These verses clearly point out what a flesh-led life looks like. So in verses 19 to 21, Paul provides a list of sins. And you've probably seen in various other parts of the New Testament where there's other lists or similar lists to this as well. And in the New King James Version, which I'm, I'm sharing with you uh, from this morning, there are 17 sins. More modern translations have 15 sins. And this list can be divided into four sections. There are sexual sins in verses, verse 19, religious sins at the start of verse 20, the rest of verse 20 to the start of verse 21 are social sins, and then the rest of verse 21 are sins of excess. I think, you can really, I think it really, it's helpful, it was helpful for me anyway, to break it down that way. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's actually look at what these are. So in the first section of, of sexual sins, there are four listed. There's adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. Now, obviously, if you've, if you've got a different version, it might read different, slightly differently for you. Now, the, the more modern translations leave off adultery, um, specifically. So the first two, are, they're straightforward. Adultery, we, we pretty much know what that means these days. It's, it's when people who are married or people that are married participate in sexual relations with others that they're not married to. All right, fornication is, is different from this, but it involves people who are not married having uh, sex with others. The Greek for fornication, however, is, is actually broader than the English understanding here. And it refers to all forms of illicit, illicit sexual activity. So you could argue that it's covering adultery as well. Uncleanness refers to any moral impurity. And it's also used in scripture to refer to ceremonial uncleanness. Basically anything that prevents a person from approaching God. Lewdness refers to unrestrained sexual indulgence. Well, the second section is, is the religious sins. And there's two here for this. There's idolatry and sorcery. Now, idolatry, again, straightforward. We get this. It's, uh, it's the worship of something created, which is in direct opposition to the worship of the creator himself. Originally, a physical idol uh, in ancient times helped, <coughs> helped visualize the God it represented but later, people ended up worshipping the physical object itself rather than the God that it was representing. Warren Wearsby says, Idolatry is simply putting things ahead of God and people. We are to worship God, love people, and use things. But too often, we use people, love self, and worship things, leaving God out of the picture completely. I think that's a, sadly, that's a good summary. Of how we tend to be. The Greek behind the word sorcery is where we get our modern day word for pharmacy from. Uh, and another person says that originally this term referred to medicines in general, sorcery, the term, but eventually only to mood altering and mind altering drugs, as well as the occult, witchcraft, and magic. Many pagan religious practices required the use of these drugs to aid in communication with deities. That's how they, they viewed it. Drug taking was, was a normal part of pagan worship in ancient times. And it, it enabled those who were in charge to maintain a level of control over the worshippers and to enhance the acting out of their sinful practices. So this is pretty disgusting stuff. 
here in these first two groups. The third section consists of social sins, and there are eight listed here. There's hatred, contentions, jealousies, and again, your version may be slightly different, Out outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy. Now these, we would say, are the more common day-to-day -day sins that are less excessive, but just as sinful in God's eyes. Hatred can be described as the attitude that puts up the barriers and draws the sword. It's the opposite of love that holds out the hand of friendship and the arm of love. It's seeking to just hate on people. It's extreme hostility towards an enemy. Contentions is a general term that carries the idea of all kinds of self-centred rivalry, strife and contentiousness. And specifically about the truth, too. Jealousies literally mean to be hot or to boil. It's the grudging looks targeted at a person because they have something that we want or feel that we should have. Outbursts of wrath. They're simply extreme and intense brief out outbursts of anger. Selfish ambitions. The displays of extreme selfishness. The desire to be top dog, to be number one. Dissensions are divisions into opposing groups. Disunity, discord or strife that arises from a difference of opinion. I find this an interesting one. As, as someone who used to be a bit of a gamer myself, video gamer that is, um, there's, there's an app, you've probably heard of it, called Discord. Teenagers probably know about this. All right, it's called Discord, and it's a way to communicate online with other gamers. Like exchange photos, videos, all this kind of stuff. And I find it interesting that it's called Discord. It's actually called something that, it's, it's a term, they've, they've picked a term that is about dividing, division, arguments. It's somewhat disturbing if you think about it, but anyway, I found that interesting. Heresies is the next one. And it refers to factions or sects. It is, it is a choosing and came to mean an opinion, principle or belief chosen. Spurgeon said of this particular sin, he said, This is the kind of hate that makes every man set up to create his own religion, write his own Bible and think out his own gospel. The final sin in this section is empty. Which means not just wanting what another person has, but also resenting that person for having it. It's one further sinful step from jealousies. Final section. We're almost there. It's a tough road, we're getting through it. Fourth section. All right. Sins of excess. These include murders, drunkenness and revelries. More modern translations leave out murders. Which obviously is an excess in that you're actually taking someone's life. This is an extreme excess. And, and this can be a result of jealousies and envy. It is acting on the resentment felt towards another person and willfully taking their life from them. And this is something that only God should really have the right to do. Drunkenness is intentional and habitual intoxication. This is, I don't think it's referring to a social drink here at all. I think it's referring to continual, habitual drinking, daily, constantly. Someone committing this sin simply goes from one drink to the next with no sense of normal existence. They've drunk so much that they've made their body dependent on alcohol. It's like it's a pastime. It's what they do in their spare time. They drink. And it's no surprise that in two of the three New Testament uses of this word, the next one, reveries, comes side by side. This describes groups of drunken people partying and using, uh, usually causing trouble. One translation uses the word orgies to describe this particular sin. 
Well, at the end of this thorough and extensive list, Paul adds in verse 21, and the like. Showing that this list is not the full list of sins that you can commit. They're only, it's only representative of the sin that's out there. And I, I think it seems to me the longer that I live, it seems that, that humans seem to be able to make more and more sins. <laughs> we seem to invent new ways to sin, which is really, really sad. He also reminds the Galatian believers that he has warned them before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's specific about that. And again, it's practice. It's this idea of habitually doing this. It's this idea of doing it willfully and not actually feeling any sense of, re- of, of remorse or seeking forgiveness for any of this. He states something similar in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. If we sin, we corrupt ourselves. So how can we therefore inherit something that is incorruptible? We can't. It doesn't make sense. Also, in Ephesians 5 and verse 5, it says this, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. The scripture is very clear about that. Jesus also teaches on the works of the flesh by pointing out in Mark 7 that sin comes from within us. It's not what enters our body he talks about it's not the things that we eat that cause us the sin the sin comes from within us jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it i think sometimes we probably don't know the depths of our own sinfulness at times But Paul doesn't share this long list of sins without sharing the opposite godly traits as well. So next we have the fruit of the Spirit. This is probably the section of this chapter that you probably hear a lot of sermons preached on regularly. And thank God that we do. Verse 20 begins with a little word, but, to emphasise the change in Paul's tone here. And let me say, praise God that there is a change. It's almost like as you go through this list, and I found that as I studied this list of sins, it was like it was driving me to depression because it was just so terrible. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Paul now gives nine virtues that are evidence of being led by the Spirit. Note the designation of fruit, not deeds. Deeds or works speak of what man can do. As with the works or the deeds of the law. That's what man does. Deeds of the law. On the other hand, fruit must grow out of a life. In the case of the believer, it grows out of the life of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and produces his fruit in and through us. There's one other important contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. The products of the flesh are plural, whereas the product of the spirit is singular. So often I hear, every time someone says it, I say the fruits of the spirit. I'm like, no, 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 it doesn't say that. Fruit of the spirit. These nine virtues form a unified whole, a unity, like a cluster of grapes attached to one branch. What this means is that all of them are to be found in the believer. All of them. It's been said that a given person may habitually practice only one or two, or perhaps a half dozen of the sins Paul mentions here. But it would be practically impossible for one person to be habitually active in all of them at once. 
The fruit of the Spirit, on the other hand, is always produced completely in every believer, no matter how faintly evidenced its various manifestations may be. Fruit, whether physical or spiritual, has always come from God. The Lord reminds Israel in Hosea 14 verse 8 that it was only through his power that they, would, they were able to grow good fruit, saying, your fruit is found in me. In the New Testament, the sacrifice of praise from our lips, winning souls to Christ, and good works in general are spiritual fruit that are produced through believers. But here Paul gives us the attitudes that undergird these actions. These attitudes are outward signs of salvation. To add to that, let me say that if after examining your life, and I hope you do this morning, have a, if you, I hope that you examine your life to see if these are evidence in your life, and if they're not, then I, I would ask, I would plead with you to find someone to... See if you actually truly are believed and how a believer, and if you can be saved, right? Because today is the day of salvation. You don't want to take, you don't want to miss an opportunity. You don't want to live eternally separated from God in, in damnation. So let's take some time to consider these nine virtues as well. The first and most important one is love. It's the virtue that earlier in verse 14 Paul said fulfills all the law. And it's seen when we love our neighbours. One commentary says, In modern English, the first three qualities, love, joy, peace, are often associated with feelings of well-being. As we see in verse 14, love benefits others. Joy is most vividly seen amid suffering. Peace prevails instead of the social sins, instead of hatred, contentions, jealousies, and these sins. We see long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, all displayed when the natural fleshly response would be harshness, retaliation, and giving up. This is also seen clearly in Colossians 3, verses 12 to 13. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. We also see this in Paul's words to his understudy Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. And, as, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. It's a challenge to all those who seek to lead God's people. The last virtue, self-control. to do with restraining one's passions and appetites. While on earth, Jesus was the epitome of self-control. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, Paul describes self-control as a virtue needed for athletes who are striving to win first prize in a race. May we each run the race that God has given us with self-control so that we may give him glory and that we may obtain the prize. Paul ends... Verse 23, with an interesting point that would have been important for the Galatians to hear. Against such there is no law. This shows that like the list of the works of the flesh in verses 19 to 21, this is only representative of the fruit of the Spirit. This is not the complete list. It also shows that the world does not make laws against these virtues. In fact, they actually see them as positive things. They see them as good things that are good to possess. But what is of most importance to the Galatians, or would have been to the Galatians, is that one does not have to become Jewish by adopting the whole Mosaic law in order to appreciate and understand these. 
After presenting these two contrasting lists, Paul explains the way we are to live. He begins this by explaining the state of every believer in verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. John Stott points out that if we have crucified the flesh, and then he puts in bracket, which we have, then we must leave it securely nailed to the cross where it deserves to be. We must not finger the nails. And if we live in the spirit, which he says again in brackets, which we do, then we must walk by the spirit. So often we want to pull down the flesh off that cross. We want to pull it down. We want to bring it back to life again. In the next chapter, in verse 14, Paul says that we should not even think of entertaining this thought. But think only of what Christ has done on the cross. But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Romans 6.6 6 also reminds us that we are no longer slaves of sin. Our passage ends in verse 25 with a challenge that would do us all good to remember and do. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Since God's Spirit is in us, if you're a believer here today, since God's Spirit is in you, let us live in a way that shows that He is. John Stott's words are worth noting here again. This victory is within reach of every Christian. For every Christian has crucified the flesh. And every Christian lives by the Spirit. Our task is to take time each day to remember these truths about ourselves and to live accordingly. We can have that victory. We can have daily victory by walking in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And avoid fulfilling the lust of the flesh by knowing the works of the flesh, but bearing the fruit of the Spirit and showing that we live in the Spirit. Let me conclude with these words from the Lord Jesus in John 6 verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. And they are life. May we listen to the words of our Saviour today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this sobering passage that we've considered this morning. Lord, as we've looked at these works of the flesh, but Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that you didn't just leave us with a list of sins that we were not to do. You've shown us in your word how that we can produce in our lives, or our lives can produce the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of your Spirit. So Lord, I pray that you would help us, that you would guide us, that you would enable us to walk daily in your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we seek to be pleasing you, to be bringing you glory in our lives not to being being distracted by what the world offers. But may we seek to be lights in a very dark world. So Lord, I pray for these dear people this morning. Lord, it's been such a delight and a pleasure to be here and share share your word with them this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help them to do that. You would help me to do that. That we would all seek to uh, walk in your spirit and by your spirit. Lord, be with us in this uh, coming weeks and months ahead. And uh, Lord, we just specifically think of Pastor Phil this morning, Lord, we pray you'd be with him. Uh, Lord, and we pray that you'd be with him in his time in the States, Lord, and bring him back soon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Glenn. Um, God bless you. And Brother Glenn uh, travels from uh, Bacchus Marsh, the other side of town, to come to speak to us. Uh, and thank you for the reminder of how much Jesus uh, freed us from the law of this flesh and sin um, by him taking our sins on himself 
in paying the debt that we owe. Um, so we thank God for Glenn. We thank you for the good news. Congratulations. We pray for, remember to pray for Brother Glenn uh, as well for his future plans. Uh, so we'll continue to praise God. And as you sing, remember how much God uh, did for you. So when you sing, you should be thankful to God. He paid for all those sins that we were reminded of this morning. Jesus paid on himself. He took our sins. He who knew no sin becomes a sin for us. So we become the righteous of God. So let's continue praising God. I'll call Brother Roger to continue lead us in, in singing. Please stand up. Thank you. Please stand up. We're going to sing our last song. Turn your eyes up on Jesus. Thank you. Please be seated. One last one.